for almost a half a century old of introduction to the Hebrew Bible. I'm going to move that microphone closer to me. Um, and then if you all have things to say, I'll repeat it for them. But that way they can, will be able to hear me okay, since I do most of the talking. In the Thank you for joining us. Um, uh, so a smaller crowd tonight than normal online and in person both. This is why the Episcopal Church shuts down in the summer. Yeah. One whiff of good weather, and everyone's like, I'm not doing anything for church. So thank you all for being my trusty band tonight as we go through the, and the really because the Elisha site, these cycles that you get in the Hebrew Bible, the Elijah stories, the Elisha stories, they're fascinating stories. So I really think that I hope that you'll enjoy as we uh work through them all. So let's go ahead and get going here with a word of prayer. The Lord be with you. Let so with you. Let us pray. Grant we beseech you, Almighty God, that we who believe that the blessed Elijah, your prophet and our father, was wonderfully carried up in a fiery chariot, may by his intercession be raised to the desire of heavenly things and rejoice in the society of your saints. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Uh, hi, Aaron. Welcome. Good to see you joining us tonight. Um, hi, Aaron. Hey, you're a big A, man. I hey, can't Tony. get my camera working, so all you get is Tony Reed tonight. Yeah, you're a big, oh, you're a big, is. you're a big A. That could go a couple of different ways, yeah. Tony. So be careful. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so what we're gonna be? So I, I did have this this same prayer we used uh, last week. If you're, if those of you that were with us remember, prayer for the Carmelites used when they celebrate the feast of Elijah, and given the fact that the Elisha cycle and the Elijah cycle obviously overlap because Elisha is the successor of Elijah, I figured that I could get away with using that prayer one more time. Uh, so let's go ahead and jump in just to review some things, the text we use for this class. If you don't have a, a, a solid study Bible to use, I recommend the New Oxford Annotated Bible, New Revised Standard Version. I'll have the pretty leather bound version here, but it comes in paperback or hardcover, excellent study Bible, how to read the Bible book by book, excellent if you ever just want to open a, a book of the Bible, but have an idea what you get yourself into. Uh, Fee and Stewart do a great job with that. And then of course, our in-depth commentary for this section is First and Second Kings by Nelson in the Interpretation Commentary series. So let's review a little bit and see what you all remember from last week, those who are with us. So if you get any of these right, Amanda, you get like five extra points. So, so you know that's possible. The points are worth nothing. Just don't, don't get too excited about that. What do you remember about the structure of the story of Kings from this point forward? What did we say about how that structure goes? But it's going to be the north and the south, calling the story of both kings, so the kingdom is divided. And there's something about the way the story of each of the kings is told. It starts with um, Sancho became king, and his father was, and sometimes his mother. And maybe sometimes he did good things, but then he was bad after all. He went back to worshiping the, the um, foreign gods. And then, then he died and slept with his fathers and was buried. Um, depending on where, and then his son became king, and so on and so on. Yeah, and to paradigmatic history, the solid structure that's used over and over again in it, um, and, and, and always a little more informa information about the southern kings than about the northern kings. We also notice that because, of course, remember the book of First and Second Kings is written from the perspective of the southern kingdom of Judea compared to the northern kingdom of Israel. Um, and so you get the basic structure here when it comes to the Judean kings, um, which is laid out here. And like I said, is a little fuller than the version you get for the um, uh, Isra Israeli kings. But uh, introduction, secret, introductory synchronism, well, how old they were, where they were enthroned, length of the reign, name of the mother, theological judgment. They did good or they did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And then, you know, in all the other works of King so-and-so, are they not written in the annals of the kings of Judah? And so-and-so died and was buried in the name of his successor. So kind of a, a, a structure that we follow through over and over again. Um, and as I said, Judean one is a little more fulsome. 
But we also see a pattern of apostasy and reform. And what you'll notice as you follow that pattern is, is it keeps going worse and worse and worse. And in a lot of ways, the book of First and Second Kings resembles the book of Judges in that way. Because the book of Judges is also very paradigmatic in its structure, right? A, you know, something horrible happens, then a judge arises over the land, and the judge does this, and then the people fell again and and, uh, and and we talk we did judges how the cycle goes down it's a downward spiral and the same thing at first it's like at kings the spiral is going down and as you get there are periods of reform but the reforms become less impressive as time goes on and we introduced the prophet elijah um then uh in our elijah cycle and when Elijah um, talks to a remember Elijah, most prophets are introduced in the story kind of as this uh, wonderful, you know, and then this, the Lord spoke to me and called me in this land and then this wonderful call narrative, they go out, but Elijah just is thrown into the middle of the story. Remember, there's no real introduction to who he is. He's just announced into the story. And there's a specific challenge he makes when he speaks to Ahab. Do you remember what that challenge is? It relates to the God of Ahab. I think it's water. See. What, what does Elijah say that God's not going to do? Don't let it rain. Yeah. <laughs> One second. <laughs> <laughs> why, why, why would it why would a refusal why would, it, would the Lord Yahweh refusing to let rain fall how would that be a specific challenge to the God of Ahab uh, the, the, uh, the Baal, Baal is, is the God of rain and storm yeah, yeah right it, 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 it'd be like telling Michael Bublé you cannot seem pretty anymore it's like that's all Michael Bublé does, right? That's what Baal does. Baal, however you want to pronounce it, is the god of thunder and harvest and rain. So to say that, god, that Yahweh is going to stop that is a significant challenge to Baal, the rain god. And then we get three stories of Elijah involving three miracles to introduce him. Can anyone remember those three stories, those three miracles? Okay, he goes and hides out, and um, the ravens feed him. The ravens. Right, so you got the ravens yeah, bringing bread in the morning and meat in the evening, uh, which recalls the wanderings in, in the wilderness when there was manna in the morning and sometimes quails came from the sea in the evening. Yeah, so you, so the first miracle is a very passive miracle, the miracle of the miraculous feeding by the ravens that we've got a picture of. What's the second miracle of Elijah? That's number three. Oh. Number two is the miraculous jar of oil and flour. Remember, the jar doesn't run out. He goes to Assyria. He goes to the land, actually, of Jezebel, outside of the boundaries of, the, of Judah and of Israel. And he stays with this, this woman who's apparently wealthy, but dying because of the, the drought. And he says, you know, take care of me and, I'll, and, and the bread and the, and the flour and the oil will not. And miraculously, it doesn't. But then the son dies. That's what uh, Philo was getting at. And he resuscitates the sun, right? Laying across three times, praying for God to save him. So as we see the, uh, in these stories, Elijah goes from passive to active, right? And so in some ways, you can say that these, this is kind of a preparatory period for Elijah preparing him to do the work that he will do, which is a very different way of telling the beginning of a, prof of a prophet's story in the Hebrew Bible. It's very distinct to Elijah. But we also talked about how that idea of this preparatory time to begin ministry um, is kind of imagined yet again um, later in the Bible when it comes to who? Who had a preparatory period of, say, 40 days in the wilderness before he began his public ministry? Jesus, right? So in some ways, scholars wonder if that, that part of the gospel related to Jesus is inspired by um, this Elijah narrative, this preparatory idea. All right. Chapter 18, we talked about um, Ahab and Elijah confronting once more. And they each call each other. There's the trouble. Ahab sees Elijah and says, is it you, you troubler of Israel? And Elijah says, it's not me, it's you that troubles Israel. And we think, well, you're just going to have a slap fight. I mean, you, this seems like a very silly sort of thing. But there's a theological significance to that word 
Troubler. Do you remember what that is? With a very significant meaning in the ancient Near East. It's used in oath contexts, particularly for someone who makes a foolish oath or someone who breaks an oath. And so in the eyes of Ahab, Elijah is a foolish troubler. He's making a foolish oath by promising this drought, even though it's turning true. And on the flip side, Elijah says, no, Ahab, you are the troubler because of the way that you have not kept covenant with God. So that word troubler is related to covenants and oaths. That's an important theological point. And then we get this contrast where there's, you know, uh, set up a wood on the altar and we'll see if Baal can bring fire down or Yahweh can. And the worship of the two gods, the worship of Baal compared to the worship of Yahweh is markedly contrasted. What, 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 what do you remember about how is the worship of Baal so different than the worship of Yahweh? A living sacrifice? Nope, both of the sacrifices are dead. So the worship of the worship of Baal, the worship of Baal is frenzied, limping, ineffective. They're kind of running around, they're cutting themselves, they're howling and crying out to God, and nothing's happening. Compare that with the worship of Elijah of God. Elijah's worship is careful, it's slow, it's dignified. And I'm going to fix that typo real quick so I don't forget and put it on the internet. That yeah, way. but that's that's Elijah here, and it's presented that way. But there's also a, a tradition of the Hebrew prophets, Brotherhood of the Prophets, that 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 go into ecstasy and 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 speak ec with ecstatic speech and 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 movement and perhaps dance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you remember, remember when King Saul became king, one of the things that marked him is is he's truly the king is he had an ecstatic utterance and prophecy with the prophets of ancient. So some, some scholars think that this is another, a lot of what we've talked about throughout this series, a lot of what we're seeing going on religiously, you have to remember, is there's a difference between the idealized presentation of the religion of Israel and the folk religion of the actual people of Israel. It's what a lot of scholars think that we're seeing is you're watching that develop and shift and change. And so Saul kind of comes out of the federalized tribal judge system when perhaps it was much more of a folk religion with high places all over the land. And, and, and in the eyes of the Deuteronomist, worship should be in Jerusalem. Worship should be done by an authorized priest of the temple. Worship should be stately and dignified and reverent. So, uh, so Carolyn's point that this is probably a little anachronistic, that in the time of Elijah, there was still probably frenzied worship of Yahweh. Absolutely true. This is the that Deuteronomist editor looking back and kind of trying to draw that distinction between folk religion and what he would say is the authorized religion of the people, which in the temple is very carefully laid out, contrary to the folk religion we see in other parts of scripture. Good point, Carolyn. Thank you for that. And um, the Northern Kingdom is in revolt against this newfangled temple thing uh, in Jerusalem. And everybody's supposed to go to the temple. We never used to go to the temple in the old time religion. <clears throat> yeah, they want to get out to you gotta go find a high place, have yourself a good old fashioned revival with Yahweh and make it make a make a wonderful celebration of it compared to what's trying to be done in the centralizing mood. How does God respond then to Elijah's prayer when Elijah says, God, consume this sacrifice that the people may know that you, Yahweh, are God? How does, how does God respond? What does God, what happens? Does God say, okay? Does God say, no? Does God, what does God do to the, to the sacrifice? Consumes it, right? And that's what you, that, this great picture here of the fire. So the idea would have been, so if Baal is going to do this, the people are imagining that, that Baal would strike the altar with lightning and that would kindle the fire, right? So Elijah, who takes the altar, drenches it with water. And then if not lightning that comes down, kind of it's like a surprising natural phenomenon, but it's un, an undeniable theophany of fire pouring down from heaven and consuming the whole offering in and of itself. Uh, a perfect whole offering, we talked about that. This is the fire of Yahweh, the divine warrior. 
How do the people respond when they see Yahweh's fire fall? Do they run away? Do they believe? What do they say? Right? They fell on their faces. And then what do they do? <laughs> they slaughter those false prophets. That's a talk about give me some good old time religion. Let's get back to the days when we killed all of the false prophets. That's, a, you know, I will really say if we, ha if we had more killing of false prophets in American <laughs> Christianity, I think we'd all be a lot better. There wouldn't uh, be anybody left. I will slap my sword upon my thigh and I will ride out in triumph against the false prophets. No, oh, this is going to be unusual. Jared, I don't really believe that. Yeah, Tony. Oh, never mind. I, I withdraw the comment. You just remembered it's on YouTube, too. Um, <laughs> what, does, what does Elijah do in response to this? What, what does Elijah do? Filled with the Spirit. Remember that? He tells Ahab, you better get to just. Ahab, there's a storm coming. Guy, the storm of Yahweh is coming. So you better get to, Je to, to Jezreel, 25 kilometers away. And Ahab jumped in his chariot. He's riding to Jezreel. And Ahab, filled with the spirit, runs faster than the chariot of Ahab, the full 25 kilometers to Jezreel in advance of the, of the storm that God is sending that will end the drought. So this is a profound um, uh, experience and a, a big thing that happens. Um, but then things kind of go downhill because uh, it's not fun to have your God threatened. So Ahab's wife, Jezebel, threatens to kill Elijah. You saying, you know, what you've done to my prophets, I'm going to do to you before the day ends. And so Elijah flees. Uh, but Elijah's flight away from the dangers of Judah changes um, kind of ever so slowly into something else. Do you remember how that flight changed into something other than a, a flight? It, 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 it starts as a flight motivated by Jezebel's oath, but then it soon changes into a movement directed by God to recommission Elijah, to assure him of his prophetic office and authority. And his uh, journey uh, takes him. Where do you remember where his journey takes him? There's a, I, I, there's a hint in the, the line above that question. Um, yeah, Horb. Yeah, you have... Uh, so, uh, but starts right at the solitary broom tree, but eventually takes him to Horeb, the mountain of God, and this 40 day journey that echoes the story of Moses. Um, and, and Elijah has forgotten a very key point. What does Elijah think is going on right now in terms of himself and the, the fidelity of the people? I'm the only prophet left. Everyone's forsaken your way. He's forgotten Obadiah, remember, who serves in the king's court, the way Obadiah has already protected 100 prophets in Israel in two different. So there are faithful people in Israel still. There are other prophets, but in his, in his depression, he has forgotten that he's not alone. Um, and then he hears something on Mount Horeb. Do you remember what he hears? Yes, yes. God commands Elijah to come out. So God, so Elijah's going to witness a theophany. But and there's a there's thunder. There's you know there's the fire. There's the thunder. All of these kind of normal ways you'd see God. And Elijah doesn't come, doesn't come out till it's all over. And then when it's all over, he comes out and hears a soft murmuring sound, or the sound of sheer silence, or a still small voice, depending how you want to translate the Hebrew there. And in that still small voice, Elijah experiences a new call from God. Um, and part of Any, that, go ahead, Carolyn. Is anybody else old enough to remember Simon and Garfunkel's Sound of Silence? Yes, yes, wonderful. The words of the prophets, right? Written on the subway right. walls. Right. Words right. of the prophets, written on the subway walls. <laughs> what, a, what a part of Elijah's commission. You know, Elijah is told you're not alone. There's all these other prophets um, and go and do this and go and do that. One of the things that he's told to do is to go ahead and go commission his successor, who is Elisha. So he, he leaves the mountain and he finds Elisha. And what do we know about Elisha, um, given uh, when he's called, given the way he's described? He was uh, wealthy? Yeah, he's a farmer, but a well, he's, dry, he's got 12 yoke of oxen. Who farms with 12 yoke of oxen? This is a very wealthy farmer that he has. Um, and then what does he do when Elisha throws his mantle over him? 
You remember? He gives it up. Yeah, he's on chain. Well, can I first go back and hey, honey, how you doing? Good to see you. Uh, Macy's he should be in there. Oh, if it's not, it's in the back of my truck. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, sorry. Sorry. Um, so, yeah, yeah Macy's going to come out in a minute. So a crew of 12 men plowing. Uh, he says, I want to go back. And Elijah, Elijah says, what have I done to you? In effect, saying, you get to choose what happens here. Um, whether and the question is, is Elisha going to just be a servant or is Elisha going to be the prophet? Um, and so what does, Eli, what does Elisha do? And does he go back and talk to his family and kind of get everything in order? Remember what he does? He slaughters the 12, the 12 yoke of oxen. Yeah, is it all 12? Because my, the uh, Jerusalem Bible says uh, the pair of oxen, which would suggest he, he's, he's, Plowing with one pair and, and, and he's got yeah. with the other eleven pair. And he used the plow, used the plow to make the fire. I don't, right. Yeah, the bye honey, bye Maisie. Bye. Yeah, the, you know, I'm not sure I'd have to look at the Hebrew. It, uh, probably the Hebrew is a little um is a little unclear. I would like to assume he he boils all twelve, which just makes a better story. So that's the preacher's answer. The scholar's answer would have to look at the Hebrew though. Yeah. So that is the cycle of Elijah. There's a lot of cover, but I want to be sure we get that because Elijah is such a hugely important person in the story of the people of Israel. Um, and now we're going to move into second. What we got to remember as we move into second Kings is the books of first and second Kings were originally a singular book. They were divided later. And even if you read, if you go from the last verse in first Kings to the verse, first verse in second Kings, you can tell that this is not meant to be divided because first Kings ends, um, Ahaziah, son of Ahab, began to reign over Israel in Samaria in the 17th year of King Jehoshaphat of Judah. He reigned two years over Israel. He did what is evil in the sight of the Lord and walked in the way of his father and mother in the way of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, who caused Israel to sin. He served Baal and worshipped him. He provoked the Lord, God of Israel, to anger just as his father had done. That's the end of the book, kind of a weird ending. But then you continue the next one, after the death of Ahab, Moab rebelled against Israel. Ahaziah had fought. So it, don't, the books aren't meant to be divided. They were divided later, but really they were originally written as a singular unit. So that's an important thing to remember. Um, the other thing to know is it's actually in, in the, in, uh, the um, Hebrew Bible, First and Second Samuel and First and Second Kings are all one book. They're the four book of kingdoms. They're like that in the Septuagint as well, I think. Um, so these are these are a singular story. So you can it's kind of it's a, it's a really it's what you know sometimes you watch a movie and the movie ends and you're like, okay, you basically just want to make a sequel. Like you're not even attempting to finish the story. So that that's what it kind of feels like if you don't follow it otherwise. Uh, but we've got to go to Second Kings chapter two because all of this time Elisha has been serving as the servant of a, of Elijah. And the question will be now whether or not Elisha will take over as the new prophet. So beginning in verse one of chapter two. Now, when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a world, when Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal, Elijah said to Elisha, stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But as Elisha said, as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of the prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And Elisha said, yes, I know. Keep silent. And Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. And the company of prophets who were at Jericho drew near to Elisha and said to him, do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And Elisha answered, yes, I know. Be silent. Then Elijah said to him, stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But Elisha said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the company of prophets also went and stood at some distance from them as they both were standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his mantle, rolled it up, and struck the water. The water was parted to the one side and to the other until the two of them crossed on dry ground. Elijah keeps trying to get rid of Elisha, right? It's kind of a very bizarre thing. We don't really know why it is. Um, it, it, you know, some people, as they approach the end of life, they kind of don't want to don't want to be bothered. They want to face it on their own. 
Um, I, I've encountered that when I've done uh, end of life visits for people that they don't want people to see them like this, whatever it might be. They want to face the future, face the end on their own. Um, and then other people want to be face it surrounded by everyone. So we don't know if that's going on. We don't know if perhaps this is a series of tests that Elijah is giving to see whether or not Elisha will remain faithful. It's unclear. Um, but regardless, we see that Elisha persists and remains. With a, it looks like, Carolyn, you might have an idea about that. Oh, yeah. I see it as, as tests definitely in a three. What I tell you three times is true. Yeah. Oh, and I, once again, I where you, three times I'll go with you. And, and once again, where is that echoed in scripture, this three time question of commitment and faithfulness? Where do you hear that again in the Bible? Peter, Peter right? The, the, so you, you, one thing I really, I, I really think is the more you dive deeply into the, the Hebrew scriptures, you wind up realizing how so much of the gospels truly are echoes yes. of stories in the Hebrew Bible over and over and over again. You can't deny the Judeo heritage of those stories. Um, that line that Elisha gives, I will not leave you, is actually the same phrase in Hebrew that Ruth had spoken to Naomi. If you remember that, when Naomi um, is left a widow and she goes, she's, in, she's in the land of Moab and she's going to go back to her people and she tells um, Orpha and Ruth, you know, go find other husbands, leave me. And, Ru and Ruth says, I will not leave. I will not leave you. And so it's that same kind of fidelity being promised and echoed here. So that would argue in favor of the test theory. To be clear, this journey is a pointless journey. Gilgal to Jordan to Bethel to Jericho to Jordan. I mean, it's kind of going in circles throughout the wilderness and back. Um, the journey isn't the point, uh, other than going out into the wilderness across the Jordan, across the Jordan and back. Um, it's, it's almost as though he's kind of trying to really shake him from his tail. And then that you cross the Jordan on dry ground, that Hebrew phrase there, dry ground, is an ex echo of the Exodus and conquest narratives. In Exodus 14, when the people of Israel crossed through the Red Sea on dry ground, and then in Joshua 3 and 4, uh, when the people of Israel, when they entered the promised land from that um, eastern border of, of the Jordan, um, how the water split, remember when the Ark of the Covenant entered the water and they went through on dry ground. So this is a reversal or a recapitulation, depending on how you look at it, of that ancient history um, happening right here in this story. Um, thoughts, comments? So the mantle pass is continuing in verse nine. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, tell me what I may do for you before I'm taken from you. Elisha said, please let me inherit a double share of your spirit. He responded, you've asked a hard thing. Yet if you see me as I am being taken from you, it will be granted. If not, it will not. And as they continued walking and talking, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them. And Elijah ascended in a whirlwind into heaven. Elisha kept watching and crying out, Father, Father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. But when he could no longer see him, he grasped his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. And he picked up the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood on the banks of the Jordan. He took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water, saying, Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? And when he had struck the water, the water was parted to one side and the other, and Elisha went over. So by asking for a double portion of his, what he's asking for is the inheritance of the firstborn son, because the inheritance of the firstborn son always gets a double per portion. So it's really a request to be recognized as the son of Elisha, which is an interesting point to be made because that phrase translated in the New Revised Standard Version over the company of prophets, the company of prophets we've been seeing throughout these stories. Literally in Hebrew, it is beni nevaim which is the sons of the prophets. So it's called the company of prophets, but they're literally known as the sons of the prophets. So this father-son language, this familial language is very common in the prophetic um, world at that time. And Elisha wants to be seen as the firstborn of the sons of the prophets, the true and rightful successor of Elijah. Also, of course, you know, when Elijah is taking, taking him away, he calls, he refers to him even as father. Um, and you can compare the fidelity he has here to his original calling. Remember when he was first called by Elijah, by Elijah what did he want to do? Say goodbye to his parents. At this point, he only has one parent left in this world that matters to him. 
and that is Elijah, the person he served so long. That is his father, the person he is. Um, he is uh, bound himself to the person he would not leave. Um, also, fire and wind, right? These are normal theophanies. Interestingly enough, these are the exact same theophanies Elijah ignored when he was in the cave in 1 Kings 18. Remember that? When he stood in the cave and fire came by and wind came by and Elijah didn't do anything until the still small voice came. But this time the fire and the wind come and Elijah is uh, caught up in them. Uh, Elisha sees the theophany and so his inheritance is secured. And I love that he even wants Elijah to know that he sees it, right? That he sees the chariots. He sees the chariots of uh, Israel and its horsemen. He wants Elijah to know that, that the promise has been granted, that he is indeed going to receive the full inheritance. And then there's a twofold response. At one time, he tears his clothes in mourning, but he also doesn't stop. He picks up the mantle of Elijah, which is the mantle is the sign of the prophetic office. You see that as well in the book of Zechariah, chapter 13. And then he repeats the miracle of Elijah by smacking the water, and having a transfer, though it seems he's a little hesitant when he does it, right? Elijah just kind of comes across, strikes the water, and it parts as though Elijah, you know, does this every day. But when Elisha does it, he, he says, where is Yahweh, the God of Elijah? So he's wanting to know, is it true? Have I truly inherited this double portion? Am I now the firstborn son, the rightful heir of Elijah? And then he strikes the water, it parts, affirming that he is indeed uh, the true successor. Um, continuing, verse 15, when the company of prophets, remember that the sons of, pro of the prophets, B'nai Nebaim, literally, when the company of prophets who were at Jericho saw Elisha at a distance, they declared, the spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. They came to meet him and bowed to the ground before him, and they said to him, see, now we have 50 strong men among your servants. Please let them go and seek your master. It may be that the spirit of the Lord has caught him up and thrown him down on some mountain or into some valley. Elisha responded, no, don't send them. But when they urged him until he was ashamed, he said, send them. So they sent 50 men who searched for three days, but did not find him. When they came back to him, he'd remained at Jericho. He said to them, did I not say to you, don't go? So the, this company, Sons of Prophets, um, what it, you could think of this almost as being similar to like a Greek story, right? This is the chorus, uh, the dramatic chorus in, in, in a Greek play. Um, they're kind of helping you understand what's happened in the way that a good chorus does in good Greek um, theater. They're recognizing the implications of what they've seen, but not sure, yet sure if they can believe it. And it's interesting, you know, so they, they know something has happened by, by saying that Elisha now has the authority. They're not sure what, because of course they did not see the literal chariots of fire, the, uh, the chariots of heaven because only the rightful heir saw that, right? So they saw something they weren't sure what. Um, and remember, Elijah does have a tendency to wander off into the wilderness. And so they, they want to be sure he's actually gone this time. So they do this extensive three-day search, but they don't find Elijah, which would indicate that truly Elijah has become the prophet in the land. Uh, questions, comments, thoughts? And then I'm going to continue oh. with that. Yeah, go ahead, Tony. Oh, this is probably uh, premature, but uh, there's a Passover tradition. Is that there among Jews to set a plate for Elijah? Yes. Yeah, for when Elijah comes in the person of the Messiah, when he returns. Okay. Yeah, that, that's just always uh, interested me. Yeah, and there there are folk tales about the the stranger that they realize must have been Elijah. And okay, interesting. Okay, thank you. And, and, and that of course that of course is why you know when the transfiguration narrative happens, who does of Jesus speak to on the mountaintop? Elijah. Elijah, Moses, and who else would he talk to, right? If, if, you, if you're <laughs> going to be a significant religious figure in Israel, of course you're going to have a conversation with Moses and Elijah, obviously, right? <laughs> good pop quiz who is the other person in hebrew scripture referenced in the book of genesis who also did not die enoch 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 walked with god and then he was not for god took him right so this is something that happens this in later christian tradition 
um, becomes representative of, uh, of other, other, other stories that are out there, people not dying. Most specifically, this becomes a significant part of the traditions surrounding the assumption of who would you guess? <sighs> the Blessed Virgin Mary, bodily assumed into heaven, did not die as a mother of God, but was assumed into heaven. In the Eastern Church, they would say it's the Dormition of Mary, that she fell asleep. And then her body went up and directly into heaven, though. Um, and so, the, like I said, these stories, they echo backwards and forwards in scripture. They really, really do. Then there, Look, there's a, tra a tradition that Moses didn't die, even though it clearly says he died and was buried. The, the story still has, has to turn up. Yeah, because, it could, because if you remember, we talk about the death and burial of Moses, the Hebrew there seems to indicate that God himself buried Moses at his burial spot and that no one knows where that burial spot is except for God himself. So that kind of connects to that ancient idea. Yeah, um, good, good. Well, that, well, you know, most people have heard the story of the, the, the chariots of fire in some form, but you probably, unless you've really dug deep, haven't heard the rest of chapter two, which is actually the fun part. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna we're gonna do that now. Chapter two, continuing in verse 29, through the end of the chapter. Now, the people of the city said to Elisha, the location of the city is good as my Lord sees, but the water is bad and the land is unfruitful. Elisha said, bring me a new bowl and put salt in it. So they brought it to him and then he went, he went to the spring of water and threw the salt into it and said, thus says the Lord, I've made this water wholesome. From now on, neither death nor miscarriage shall come from it. So the water has been wholesome to this day, according to the word that Elisha spoke. He went up from there to Bethel, and while he was going up on the way, some small boys came out of the city and jeered at him and said, go away, bald head, go away, bald head. When Elisha turned around and saw them, he cursed them in the name of the Lord. Then two she-bears came out of the woods and mauled 42 of the boys. From there, he went on to Mount Carmel and then returned to Samaria. So first off, catch a couple of things. Similar to the journey of Elijah, this kind of circuitous journey, these are the high places of, of, of worship. Bethel, right? These are the places you would go. That's why there's always companies of prophets there. Um, these two prophetic legends demonstrate that Elisha is just as powerful as Elijah was. That's the purpose of these in the narrative. Um, the wonder deed in uh, verses 19 to 22 echoes a story in 1 Kings 17. Um, where there is also water made whole. It's also, of course, echoing right in the wilderness when, when there was brackish water and, got, and you know, Moses solved that issue by throwing the tree in it. This is something we were, uh, the bad water in the area may have something to do with the curse that was placed upon the side of Jericho by Joshua. That's a possibility as well. Um, uh, but this idea of taking brackish water and making it good again uh, is important. And this idea that, you know, even to this day, women go to the city and drink water from this ancient site in the hope that it'll keep their pregnancy safe because it's such a powerful living water. Um, this is uh, an expected sort of thing. That idea of, of the salt in the water as well is why in ancient rites of the church, when you create holy water, the first thing you do is you exercise salt, then you exercise water, and then you mingle the salt in the water. So if you've ever been with me when I've done a house blessing and I've made holy water and using the ancient forms, I, you'll notice I'll do that. I'll ask for some salt from your home. I will exercise evil out of it. I'll ask for water from your home. I'll exercise evil out of it. I'll blend them together and then I'll bless it and make that the holy water we'll use. I'll use that older form. But that's coming from this ancient text here. That's where that, that idea, that theme comes from. Um, the story of the children and the bear, probably either hilariously comic or unsettling, right? Uh, hey, Baldy, ah, you like Baldy, you say? You like people with more hair. Let me send someone with more hair this way. The two she-bears come in mall 40. And I like the one, the, the, the commentator that in this uh, interpretation commentary, he says that what this story does, it unsettles our post-industrial apotheosis of childhood. <laughs> Which is true, right? Before the Industrial Revolution, children were eh. <laughs> but we idolize children in our day and age. And so this is reflecting the way children are viewed in the ancient world. Don't be freaked out by it. This is, this is authentic. Um, well, that was, was that primarily because children were so likely to die yes. in infancy? 
There's so likely, to, and not to mention, there's no contraception. So you're just going to have a whole lot. You just keep, you know, pushing them out. Um, so for the ancient re reader, they would see these juvenile delinquents getting what they deserve, and they would be satisfied by that. This would be a, a pleasant story for an ancient reader to read. Um, to insult the prophet is to insult God, and Elisha makes that clear. Um, in the end, what it becomes with the modern reader is a hilarious story to talk about how when a prophet made two bears come out of the wilderness and maul a bunch of children. Um, but don't get too caught up on it. Questions, thoughts before we move on? All right. So now let's push a couple chapters ahead to look at Elisha's prophetic power as it grows with the conversion of Naaman or Nam and how you want to say it. I say Naaman because I was raised as a good Bible boy. Uh, uh, so uh, we begin with the story of a sick warrior, 2 Kings 5, beginning in verse 1. Naaman, the commander of the army of the king of Aram, was a great man and in high favor with his master because by him the Lord had given victory to Aram. The man, though a mighty warrior, suffered from leprosy. Now the Arameans on one of their raids had taken a young girl captive from the land of Israel and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, if only my Lord were with the prophet who's in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. So Naaman went in and told his Lord uh, just what the girl from the, just what the girl of the land of Israel, the, bleh, just what the girl from the land of Israel had said. Um, so uh, Yahweh has given, this is very interesting. Yahweh has given victory to Naaman, but at the expense of Israel. It's a very interesting, interesting thing that Naaman is not portrayed as an evil character. This is really foreshadowing the universalism, which is going to increasingly break out um, in the story of the Hebrew Bible as it's entering the narrative. And after being told how great Naaman was, the news that this great warrior would have leprosy would be a shock to the reader uh, because, you know, leprosy is a sign of God's judgment, that sort of thing. So it'd be a shock to us. To be clear, the Hebrew Bible classified a wide variety of skin diseases under the heading of leprosy. Apparently, Naaman's was one of the more minor types uh, that did not create social barriers. Because, of course, some forms of leprosy, you had to be divided away from the community. Other forms, it seemed to have just been some sort of skin disease. We're not quite sure what it is in Naaman's case, but it seems not to have been so serious that he's cut off because he's still, of course, functioning and living with his household. The young maid attracts our sympathy to Naaman, while also highlighting, though, the point that the weak has the key to salvation for the strong, right? This mighty warrior Naaman has no idea what to do, but this young slave girl, she knows the truth, right? There's an interesting reversal going on there. Story continues in verse 5, and the king of Aram said, go then, and I will send along a letter to the king of Israel. He went, taking with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, and 10 sets of garments. He brought the letter to the king of Israel, in which read, when this letter reaches you, know that I have sent to you my servant Naaman, that you may cure him of his leprosy. When the king of Israel heard this letter, he tore his clothes and said, am I God to give life or death that this man sends word to me to cure a man of leprosy? Just look and see how he's trying to pick a quarrel with me. This is hilarious. The letter is misaddressed, right? The 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 the, uh, the Arameans assume, well, if there's a prophet in Israel who can like cure someone of leprosy, he's surely in the king's court. And so they send not to Elisha the prophet, they send the messenger to the king. And the king, who does not have the faithful prophet of God in his court, is like, I can't cure anyone. So it's kind of a comic detour, I think. Um, the, the, the letter doesn't ask for the prophet in Samaria, it just assumes that the king will know how to save this. So it's kind of a clumsy national bureaucracy here, I think, with just with some levity to the narrative, similar to the story of the bears and the kids. The king of Israel also makes an inadvertent but important confession to the power of God, um, preparing for Naaman's coming confession. So he knows that God is the one who gives life and death and that he does not have access to that divine power of life. Um, and then, as we'll see, Elisha will take matters into his own hands when the healing happens so that he will see that there is a prophet of Israel, which is a, a rejection of, of what the king had assumed when he first talked. Continuing in verse 9. But when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent messages to the king. Why have you torn your clothes? Let him come to me, that he may learn there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his chariots and his horses, and he halted at the entrance of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, go wash in the Jordan seven times and your flesh will be restored and you should be clean. 
But Naaman became angry and went away saying, well, I thought that for me, he would surely come out and he would stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and would wave his hand over the spot and cure the leprosy. Are not Abana and Farpur, the roofs of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be clean? And he turned and went away in a rage. But the servants approached him and said to him, Father, if the prophet had commanded you to do something difficult, would you not have done it? How much more when all he said to you was wash and be made clean? So he went down and immersed himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the word of the man of God, and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a young boy. And he was clean. So Elisha puts Naaman in his place by refusing to grant him an audience. You know, this is an important person, an important era man, but he's a prophet. He has important things to do. So he just sends him a message, doesn't even visit him in person, which accomplishes exactly what Elisha hopes it will accomplish, which is to tick him off. So Naaman is given a classic narrative choice. Go to something that appears silly if you trust and what I say is going to happen. So if this is test to see what's more important to name in his pride or the health and the life that God can bring him. Uh, of course, but both Naaman's ego and national pride have been injured. Why didn't he come on talk to me? He thought he was going to do a cool song and dance routine. There was no song and dance routine. I thought that'd be very exciting. And by the way, we've got way better water back home, right? Uh, this is like, you know, if someone, you know, if I journeyed all the way to Texas to be healed and um, someone was like, well, well go, go wash in the Brazos seven times. They'd be like, listen, there's way better water in Michigan. I'm not going to the Brazos. Uh, it's exactly a similar sort of thing. Uh, Naaman's uh, jeered his local pride has been hurt. But, this, but once more, the person in power doesn't know what's going on, but the servants, the slave, the oppressed, the small people know what's going on. They get Naaman's healing back on track and he, he goes to the Jordan and he's healed. This is why, you know, over and over again, the Lord lifts up the lowly, casts down the mighty, as we hear in the Magnificat, right? This is a theme that echoes throughout the Hebrew Bible. It's, it's, so, it's so important. The, and then after this, we get the conversion, beginning in verse 15. The Naaman returned to the man of God, he and all his company. He came and stood before him and said, now that I know there is no God in all the earth except in Israel, Please accept a present from your servant. But Elisha said, as the Lord lives whom I serve, I'll accept nothing. He urged him to accept, but he refused. Then Naaman said, if not, then please let two mule loads of earth be given to your servant. For your servant will no longer offer burnt offering or sacrifice to any God except the Lord. But may the Lord pardon your servant on one count. When my master goes into the house of Rimon to worship there, leaning on my arm, and I bow down to the house of Rimon. When I do bow down to the house of Rimon, may the Lord pardon your servant on this one count. And Elisha said to him, go in peace. So now, now Naaman meets Elisha face to face, right? After the healing. Now, apparently, he's at a point that Elisha thinks he can actually have a conversation with him. Just as, Eli as Naaman's flesh has been restored, shuv in Hebrew, that word shuv, return, his flesh has been restored as shuv. Naaman returns shuv to Elisha. So there's some uh, literary connection going on there. And interesting, Naaman doesn't just now believe that there's a prophet in Israel, which is what Elisha is known for. Naaman actually confesses a, the God of Israel, but he says that the God of Israel is the only God, a stunning monotheistic conversion. Because remember, it was all with rage. You know, every nation got its own God. So it would have been enough for Naaman to, oh, well, now the the God of Israel is mightier than the gods of Aram. That would have been, that would have been the expected conversion. But for Naaman to say, I now see there's no God except the God of Israel. Monotheism, that has not existed yet in this time. So it's a really profound, for uh, uh, progressive sort of conversion. Elisha is a servant of God, though. And so Elisha declines to get a gift in response for what he did. Um, Naaman is a man with double loyalties though, right? He asks for mercy over rigorous puritanism. He knows when he goes back home to work that he'll have to go into idolatrous temples. And he says, I, when I do that, just know I'm not going there because I watch. I'm going there because I serve my king and please forgive me for when I have to go into the, to these idolatrous temples. And interestingly enough, Elisha responds with the wish of Shalom. Elisha is not rigorous or puritanical. He'll not, you can go to the I, idol's temple. It's just, it's not a real God anyways, uh, which is a real push against kind of the puritanical tendencies in religion, I think, in our own time. 
Uh, continuing in verse 20. But when Naaman had gone from him a short distance, Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, thought, hmm, my master's let the Aramean Naaman off too lightly, but not accepting from him what he offered. If the Lord lives, I will run after him and get something out of him. So Gehazi went after Naaman. When Naaman saw someone running after him, Naaman jumped down from the chariot to meet him and said, is everything all right? He replied, yes, but my master has sent me to say two members of the company of prophets, sons of prophets, remember, have just come to me from the hill country of Ephraim. Please give them a talent of silver and two changes of clothing. Naaman said, please accept two talents. And he urged him and tied up two talents of silver and gold in two bags with two changes of clothing and gave them, the, gave them to two of his servants who carried them in front of Gehazi. When they came to the citadel, he took the bags from them and stored them inside. He dismissed the men and left. And he went and stood before his master. And Elisha said to him, where have you been, Gehazi? He answered, oh, your servant has not gone anywhere at all. But Elisha said to him, did I not go with you in spirit when someone left his chariot to meet you? Is this a time to accept money and accept clothing, olive orchards and vineyards, sheep and oxen, male and female slaves? Therefore, the leprosy of Naaman shall cling to you and to your descendants forever. So Gehazi left his presence leprous, as white as the snow. So the Gehazi sequence sets Naaman's story into the perspective of the ordinary reader. It universalizes it into categories that transcend leprosy and Gentile conversion and get right to the root of these questions of faithfulness and honesty in the way you deal. Gehazi is faithlessly greedy, while Naaman is faithfully generous. Gehazi's belittling nationalism is in strong contrast to Elisha's inclusivity. Um, in some ways, you know, a lot, what's amazing in, in Naaman's conversion is he's all annoyed because he's such a nationalist guy. But after he's converted, he doesn't, he just doesn't believe that his gods and Aramar were, aren't as strong. He doesn't even think they exist anymore. He's given up that. And Elisha, by saying, it's okay for, for you to go to the temples in, in, in Aram, I'm not, you know, not going to hold that against you, is, you know, is open-minded and kind and, and, and merciful. Gehazi, though, that like, yeah, why did this Aramean off? This is, you know, he, 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 he's, he's in total contrast to the, spirit, to, to the spirit of Naaman's conversion and also to the approach of Elisha. Uh, that isn't any religious or nationalistic sentiment. It's just greedy. It reduces it to the trivial level of, yeah, what's in it for me? Yeah, yeah. And it, it's so natural and so human. This We've had the great religious conversion. And then this guy's like, okay, maybe I can love it for myself. Right, right, right. And interestingly, when 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 Naaman sees someone running, he assumes something's gone wrong, right? So he jumps off his chariot and he says, "Is everything all right?" The Hebrew there, he asking, he's asking if the shalom is still is still here, if oh. there's still the peace that Elisha had offered him, or if that has been lost. So there, there's just a, 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 a faithful conversion that you're seeing and that, that, that the, the, in all of the pride and the ego, like, why didn't he come to me? Why is, is absent. He jumps off as his chariot, walks on the ground to be sure that he hasn't done anything wrong inadvertently. So the fact that Gehazi is taking advantage of him, which this is a man that is fully converted, it just makes it all the more despicable. Yeah. Elijah knows. <laughs> yeah, Elijah knows. It, um, Damon has has accepted Yahweh as the only God, but he's still the God, especially of Egypt. And he can't imagine really worshiping Yahweh, the God of Israel, except on the soil of Israel. So he takes some with him. Yeah, right. <laughs> sort of sweet and simple and naive, but heartfelt. Yeah. So Elisha sees through the lie, and, and so Naaman's leprosy is visited on Gehazi, who gets it. So that which is kind of an interesting turn in the narrative. So before we wrap up tonight, I want to cover one more story, if we can, and that is the end of Israel and the death of Elisha in uh, chapter 13, beginning in verse 1. In the 23rd year of King Joash, son of Ahaziah of Judah, Jehoiaz, son of Jehu, began to reign over Israel in Samaria. He reigned 17 years. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, followed the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, which he had caused Israel to sin, and did not depart from them. The anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, so that he gave them repeatedly into the hand of King Hazael of Aram, and then into the hand of Ben-Harad, son of Hazael. 
But Jehoahaz, but Jehoahaz entreated the Lord. The Lord heeded him, for he saw the oppression of Israel, how the king of Aram, how the king of Aram oppressed him. Therefore, the Lord gave Israel a savior, so that they escaped from the hand of the Arameans, and the people of Israel lived in their homes as formerly. Nevertheless, they did not depart from the sins of the house of Jeroboam, which had caused Israel to sin, but walked in them. The sacred pole also remained in Samaria. So Jehoahaz was left with an army of not more than 50 horsemen, 10 chariots, and 10,000 footmen. The kings of Aram had destroyed them and made them like the dust at the threshing. Now the rest of the acts of Jehoahaz and all that he did, including his might, are they not written in the book of the annals of the king of Israel? So Jehoahaz slept with his ancestors. They buried him in Samaria, and his son Joash succeeded him. What happens beginning in chapter 13 is the chronological pace of the narrative really significantly increases. Actually, in these next two chapters, about a century of time is covered in the space of three chapters in the reigns of 11 different kings. So the kind of the theological points have been made. There's no reason to drag them out. And so you start seeing that paradigmatic cycle start turning a little more quickly. Um, it, it's what dominates. And the kings of Israel are all evil. They all follow the kings of Jeroboam. The kings of Judah do right, except in the matter of sacrifice, where they still sacrifice wrongly. Um, the, if the sentences of chapter 13 are read in chronological order, I want to be honest, the text is confusing. Um, it's not quite clear who is king when and for how long. That's probably because there's some textual corruption here in some of the ancient manuscripts. And so some of the later manuscripts, you'll see that they, they amend the manuscript about who exactly was king when. Um, but remember that this is a theological history. We're not terribly interested in who was king when. That's not what they're really interested in telling us. They're interested instead in the continued decline of the nation, even if they can't get their dates right anymore for who was king over what period. Jeho Jehoahaz is a bad king, but somehow he has the Lord on his side. We don't know how it is. Why it is that God responds to Jehoahaz despite his, uh, how, how bad he is. The identity of the Savior sent by God is not specified. It could be Elisha, that maybe this is an ancient story of Elisha, even though he's not named. It could be the Assyrian king who winds up fighting the Arameans. We don't know who that savior is who God sends. It's a, it's, a, it's a not identified person. As in the book of Judges, though, the sending of a savior does not promote the return to the Lord. You can remember that in the book of Judges. The judge would save the people, but then the people would keep on sinning. So in the same thing here, the judge saved the people, the judge brought the people back. Um, got them back into their own homes, but they keep on sinning. They, they are saved, but they will not turn back to Yahweh, which is the key fundamental point of what's going on here. So this slide and decline continues in verse 10. In the 30, 37th year of King Joash of Judah, Jehoash, son of Jehoahaz, began to reign over Israel and Samaria. He reigned 16 years. He also did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not depart from all the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, which he caused Israel to sin, but walked in them. Now the rest of the acts of Joash and all that he did, as well as the might with which he fought against King Amaziah of Judah, are they not written in the book of the annals of the king of Israel? So Joash slept with his ancestors and Jeroboam sat upon his throne and Joash was buried in Samaria with the kings of Israel. Once again, you, you, you could almost just write, this. it's like playing Mad Libs, right? Give me a funny name. Give me how many years they lived. Give me what <laughs> evil thing they did. And then you kind of stick it all in and read the Mad Lib. We could all pull this off. Little is told about Jehoash, uh, whose name is the same as his Judean colleague, oddly enough. He inherits, though, the weakened army or weakened forces, I think was my, what I meant to type there, of Jehoahaz, which is even feather. Remember the time of Ahaz. Oh, we got a, we looked to see that. Let me get that. In the time of Ahaz, the, this was a, 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 the kingdom of Israel. This was, Israel was a mighty kingdom, right? Um, and at this point, you've got what? What did you have in the time of his father? You've got left 50 horsemen, 10 chariots, and then some footmen. Mm. You're not going to do much good in battle there. So he's inheriting that weakened nation. And then we get Elisha's last prophecy as Elisha suddenly appears back in the narrative in verse 14. Now, when Elisha had fallen sick with the illness of which he was to die, King Joash of Israel went down to him and wept before him, crying, my father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. Elisha said to him, take a bow of arrows. So he took a bow of arrows. And he said to the king of Israel, draw the bow, and he drew it. And Elisha laid his hands on the king's hands, and he said, open the window eastward. And he opened it. 
Elisha said, shoot, and he shot. Then he said, the Lord's arrow of victory, the vict arrow of victory over Aram, for you will fight the Arameans in Afek until you have made an end of them. He continued, take the arrows. So he took them. And he said to the king of Israel, strike the ground with them. He struck three times and stopped. The man of God was angry with him and said, ah, you should have struck five or six times. Then you would have struck down Aram until you'd made an end of it. But now you will strike down Aram only three times. This is a bizarre story. Let's acknowledge that. Elisha has been entirely absent from the narrative to be honest, for several chapters now. It's just been telling the story of this decline of kings. Ever since Jehu was anointed 50 years earlier, we have heard nothing from Elisha until this moment. Uh, and if you remember, anointing Jehu as king was one of the tasks Elijah was given by God. Remember that? When God gave the task to Elijah and, uh, and with the still small voice, he said, uh, make Elisha your successor, and then Elijah didn't do the rest of them. One of them was to anoint Jehu. So Elisha is the one who winds up anointing Jehu, carrying on that task. Jehu did carry out some reforms, but they were largely ineffective. Um, and, and then Elisha is gone from the narrative. Uh, King uh, Joash, though, sees Elisha as the protection of Israel, as its chariots and horsemen. Interestingly enough, the same phrase that Elisha said, right? when Elijah was being taken up. In it. So, so some scholars wonder if the story of Elijah being taken up in a whirlwind is not an experience of fiery chariots, but if that is actually the chariots of Israel is a way you refer to a prophet. And if it's metaphorical language in both cases, um, that, that, that when Elisha, sh Elisha shouts after Elijah, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen, he's talking to Elijah, Elijah because Elijah is the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. Elijah is the true force that protects Israel in the same way that Joash now believes Elisha is. It, we don't know for sure, but it's an interesting uh, phraseology. Arrows were often used for divination in the ancient Near East, so that's not a, an, an abnormal part of the story. The last prophetic message we get though, is one of incomplete victory. After Elisha's death, Israel will have to rely on a lukewarm king whose prayers are undercut by their sin. So he drew the arrow, and Elisha says, you, you're going to win? He's like, now take all those arrows and fire them into the ground. And Elisha's like, yeah. I mean, Jehu's like, yeah. I mean, Joash is like, yeah, one, two, three, and then he's done. And Elisha's like, see that right there? I said, fire them all, and you just fire three. You're you're only incomplete, you're lukewarm, you're not going to follow through, you're not actually going to win. And then the last prophecy of Elisha, and we'll close with this, verse 20. So Elisha died and they buried him. Now, bands of Moabites used to invade the land in the spring of each year. As a man was being buried, a marauding band was seen, and the man was thrown into the grave of Elisha. As soon as the man touched the bones of Elisha, he came to life and stood on his feet. Now, his ail of Aram oppressed Israel all the days of Jehoahaz, but the Lord was gracious to them and had compassion on them. He turned toward them because of his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he would not destroy them, nor would he banish them from his presence until now. When King Hazael died, his son Ben-Hadad succeeded him. Then Jehoash, son of Jehoahaz, took again from Ben-Hadad, son of Hazael, the town that he had taken from his father Jehoahaz in war. Three times Joash defeated him and recovered the towns of Israel. Three times alone, though, because of the prophecy. So this last story is told with Elisha's whole prophetic career in view, reflecting on Israel's situation. The chariots of Israel and the person of Elisha are gone. Raiders can now invade the country without opposition. There's no more protection for the land. But God's power remains. And even after his death, Elisha can perform the life-giving miracles of God. I love that when that marauder is killed and is thrown into the grave, but it happens to be Elisha's grave. He touches his bones and he comes back to life, right? What a wild story is that. In the final verses, we return to the reign of Jehoahaz. These were likely inserted by a later redactor to connect us with what verses four and five. Uh, they also, though, give another reason for God's help against the Aramean, his covenants with the patriarchs. The three victories in verses 24 through 25, lots of typos in that line. Geez, I was ready to be done typing. Refer to that encounter between Elisha and Jehoahaz. All right. Comments, questions, thoughts before we wrap up for tonight? I, several years ago, I started thinking about a different take on particularly Elijah you have a, a ruler, a legitimate ruler, who is trying to control a multicultural society and remain on good terms with, with the neighboring countries 
and, and tolerate the customs of these multicultural people. And you have this crazy wild man out of the desert bringing fire and death in the name of a, a, a tra traditional god that they should go back to, which is probably anachronistic anyway. Um, it doesn't, yeah, have some problems. Yes. I mean, Ahab is not a nice person, but still. Yeah. It's tricky when you try to start really reenacting the history of what was probably going on, particularly because in the end, the person who rescues the people of Judah from the, their exile in Babylon is King Cyrus. One of the big points about King Cyrus of Persia, or Artaxerxes, depending on how you want to talk about his name, is that he was very cosmopolitan, as he thought the way to peace in the empire is you know, everyone worship their own god. And so, of course, he sends the people of Judah back to rebuild the temple and worship their own God. So how fascinating, right, that this, that, 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 that kind of open-minded cosmopolitan view is, um, you know, you know, being attacked. Now, on the, on the flip side, there's an argument to be made that Elisha, Elisha um, is not quite as rigorous as some of the people would have interpreted him. And you see that in that story of, you know, the, so what you see in the story of Naaman, you know, that he can still go into the, the idolaters temple and it's not considered a sin. Uh, you know, a lot that, that's kind of the, a, a foreshadowing of the person of the God fearer. So the Gentile person who's not converted to Judaism, but who believes in the God of Israel. And so you do get echoes of some of an open, more open-minded view. Well, and as well, like Jesus points out, you know, there are two ways to read the story of Elijah and Elisha. One is that these are nationalistic people protecting a nationalistic God, kind of tribal deity against invading, you know, progress. Um, that's not how Jesus interprets Elijah. Jesus interprets Elijah, hey, when everyone was dying in the drought, who did Elijah go save? The Syrian Nephrimite woman. Um, yeah. When people had leprosy, there were some people that had leprosy in, in, in Judah at the time of Elisha. Who did Elisha save? Naaman, the Aramean. This is the God of the God of all people, not just the God of Israel. So it's interesting that it, it really depends on how you interpret these stories, whether you interpret them as stories of kind of a rigorous exclusivity, or if you interpret these as a story of a God who is beyond these definitions and boundaries. Good stuff. Well, thank you all. We won't be gathering next week. I've got Vestry next week, so I've got to focus on that. But we'll be back in two weeks as we will talk about the decline and end of the two nations. That'll be our final class before we hit summer. So hope you'll be with me again in two weeks. And until then, I hope you have a lovely evening. Bye. Thank you. Yeah. Good night.